The views and opinions of the guests of Veterans Archives do not reflect the views and opinions of Veterans Archives, its subsidiaries, or its partners. Hello and welcome to Veterans Archives. This is a podcast where you can learn about our military history in the words and voices of the men and women who lived and created it. I'm your host, Bill Krieger, and let's listen to our next story. We are here today. It is August 23rd, 2023. I am with Sergeant Major George Butch Davis, who served in the Army, the Army Reserves, and the Army National Guard. How are you doing today? Doing well. All right. So, what year were you born and where are you from? I was born July 9th, 1959, in Uniontown, Pennsylvania, which is the southwest corner, about 70 miles south of Pittsburgh. And uh, when I was a kid, uh, we moved out to San Diego, and I lived out there for about 12 years. And then we moved back to Pennsylvania, and that's where I went to from eighth grade and graduated high school. Okay, so was the town you're from, was it like mountainy? It's right at the foothills. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, the mountains are right there. Part of Uniontown goes up onto the mountain, but I lived in, uh, when I went to high school, Lived in a little town of Smithfield, and again, it's right at the foothills. It's uh, four miles to the West Virginia line. Okay. Um. So what what was the what was the main business in in the town well, you're from? When I was growing up, it was coal mines okay. and coke ovens. Coke ovens. Yeah. So coke oven, they take coal and they dig out. A bank side, and they coat it with brick, and they light the coal on fire, get it going really good, and then quench it. Um, just spray water on it, cool it down really quick, and it makes it very hard. And uh, that's used in the uh, steel industry to add carbon to the steel. Okay. And make it harder. So, so not necessarily like the energy utility industry, but for the steel industry. Right. Coal. We didn't have any steel mills right where I was, but we had the coal okay. and the Coke ovens. Hence the reason you're a Pittsburgh Steelers fan. I am a Pittsburgh Steelers fan. Okay. <laughs> um, so did your, did your parents work at, in that industry or? No. Uh, my mom and dad, they divorced when... I don't know. I was like three. And, uh, you know, I had a stepdad in California and that's all I want. I don't want to give him no dues whatsoever. He's, (laughs) (laughs) he's something else. Piece of work. So we moved back to Pennsylvania. Uh, my mom, she worked in, uh, a glass cutting factory I made glasses and then she'd grind down the lips and everything on the glasses. She was a key punch operator at West Virginia University. Okay. Morgantown. Right. Okay. That's 12 miles from the town that we live in. Um, she drove school bus for a while after I joined the army. So. Okay. So did you have any, any siblings growing up? Yeah, I have, uh, there's five of us. I have two sisters and two brothers. I have one sister that's three years older than I am. Uh, she graduated from the same high school, fair chance, George's junior, senior high. (laughs) Okay. So I think we had a thousand students, seven through 12. This is a small school. Okay. And then... That'd be about a class B when I was growing up, I think. 
Okay. Yeah. So, somewhere in that ballpark. B, C, D. Yeah. I don't know. It's down the line. Then uh, she went to uh, LPN school, got her LPN license. Then uh, I have a brother. He's a year younger than I am. Our birthday is the same day. He retired from the uh, Marine Corps, 20 years active. How does that go when you guys talk about branches? Oh, well, it there is the dig <laughs> periodically. You know, it just, <laughs> yeah, you dog. Yeah, well, jarhead. <laughs> so, I mean, we definitely talk smack back and forth, but. We both know it's just talking smack. You yeah. Know, it's, just give them crayons and, right. and they're fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. One of my favorites is when he was in boot camp, I trained him. I said, hit the beach and throw a handful of sand up against a brick wall. So <laughs> run into the brick wall. Okay. Yeah. got you. Well, um, uh, Okay, so so are you, um, so that's two two siblings. Now I have a brother that's uh, six years younger than I am, and he retired from the National Guard. Uh, he did some active time and then into the guard, and now he is he's just retired full time. Retired. He got a job working in uh, a prison in Pennsylvania, a max security prison. So he retired from that and from the guard. And then my baby sister, she's seven years younger than I am. And she lives in Pittsburgh. Uh, her husband... His mom has a horse ranch, but she can't take care of it. So he's been doing that, building it back up. And so that's what they do. Most of their time is spent out the horse ranch, trying to build that back up. Got to imagine that's a very pretty scenery to go. Oh, it is. Yeah. It, it's beautiful. I never want to live in Pennsylvania because of politics and taxes and stuff like that. But if it wasn't for that stuff, yeah, Pennsylvania is absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. So are you still pretty close with your siblings? Yes. Yes, I am. Um, we talk very regular and, uh, yeah, we're we're close, good. And then uh, my dad, he lives in Texas. Um, just because they got divorced doesn't mean we lost touch with my dad. He was like the ultimate dad in a divorce situation. Mm-hmm. That's good, my dad. Man. Every year when we were kids, seemed like every year, uh, he would take three of us. My older sister, my brother, you're younger than I am myself. And we would drive, he would drive from San Diego back to Pennsylvania. So we knew who our grandparents and aunts and uncles were. And um, while we were there, he'd take us up so we could see my mom's mother. You know, my uncles on her side, aunts. So, because my dad really had a good knowledge of both sides of the family, Mm -hmm. even though they were divorced, you know. Wanted to keep the family together and spending time. That's good. It's a good dad to to have. Is is your mom still around? Yes. uh, Both of them are. I'm blessed in that aspect. I haven't had to go through the pain of losing a parent or sibling. So that's good. Yeah. Um, so, 
so we talked about your family and and you had some some other service in your family. You you went to high school when you graduated high school. What made you? When did you start thinking about serving? I always knew I wanted to be a soldier. I mean, I have a picture someplace of my brother and I. I think I was like five or six, and so he was five or four, and we were dressed up in ponchos and berets, and you know that we got as gifts. I don't know. Maybe it was our birthday or Christmas. I don't know. Mm-hmm. But anyway, I always knew I wanted to serve, wanted to be a soldier. So my dad, he was a Marine. I, he did his time, you know, about three years. And he got out as a corporal. It just wasn't the life for him. Mm-hmm. But back in those days, back in the 50s, late 50s, if you didn't serve, you couldn't get a job. I mean, it was very, not long after World War II, Korea, and the nation was very uh, patriotic at the time, and the military definitely held esteem Mm -hmm. and it was very hard from what he told me. I mean, I wasn't of age yet, but you know, you just couldn't get a job if you didn't have military service. Nobody wanted to hire you. And I would, I would think from stories I've heard from my own grandfather that like he would tell me that you'd walk around a neighborhood and he'd put like a, during that time they would put, put a star or something, something on their door. I forget what exactly what it was. And he said, you'd walk around a neighborhood and very rarely for those wars, would you see a house without one? Right. right. So, so I can definitely, um, I definitely understand what you're saying. Yeah. So, you know, he did his time and I just, always knew and my brother always knew he was going to serve so uh, when I was in high school a recruiter came down from reserves out of Morgantown West Virginia and got talking with him and a buddy and I we sign us up what what year was this 76. So ni- 1976, right. um, Army Reserves recruiter. Okay. Right. So we got talking. Uh, my friend, his dad was a truck driver. He wanted to be a truck driver. And it sounded okay to me. So, hey, we'll go as truck drivers. 88 Mike. Was it 88 Mike then? I don't even remember what it was. Okay. But uh, we went to MEPS and I Where broke was the my MEPS glasses. Where was Pittsburgh? In, no, in uh, Morgantown. In Morgantown. So I broke my glasses um, or glasses all my life until about three years ago. And the VA operated on my eyes, so I don't need them anymore, Mm -hmm. which is fantastic. But I broke my glasses, and they were giving me the color blindness thing, you know, all the dots supposed to make numbers. Well, I couldn't see anything any damn way. (laughs) And they said, no, you're colorblind. You can't be a, a truck driver. You can be a mechanic. All right, well, fine, I'll be a mechanic. And back then, we didn't have money to pay somebody to work on our vehicles. You you worked on them yourself. There was no computers or nothing. Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. So I enlisted as 63 Bravo. And uh, which is now 91 Bravo. Okay. 
Yeah, yeah because even since I've retired, they changed the MOSs to yeah. align with the officer's branch. So, um, I went to basic training at Fort Dix, New Jersey. And was that in 1976? 77. 77. Just after I graduated. Um, I said I do. I enlisted on 14 September 76, but it was a delayed entry until yeah. I graduated high school. I used to go up and drill at uh, the armory up in Morgantown. Okay. And uh, so, we're, so yeah, you were Army Reserve, so you could go from state, like you could be in another state. Right. That makes sense. And it's funny because back then there was still a whole lot of non-vets and guys who joined the guard to keep or reserve to keep from going to Nam. So I remember one time went up there, they were going to the rifle range in uh, Kingsbury, West Virginia, I think. Mm-hmm. But uh, anyway, we're in the back of a deuce and a half riding there. And this guy reaches up and takes off his hat and takes off his wig his hair is like down past his shoulders and everything, but then he put his hair back up underneath his wig, which was close to regulation. It's still a little long, but nobody really said anything to him about it. And I guess there was quite a few guys that used to wear wigs. So they could so, have long hair. Yeah. I've never heard that before. <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> It was crazy. It was, what the hell? <laughs> yeah, know? I would say the same thing. <clears throat> or my hair was short anyway because, and when I went to high school, I played football, wrestled, and ran track. And if you were an athlete, your the hair could not be past the middle of your ear, and it couldn't touch your collar. Uh huh. If it did. You couldn't play. That's wow. all there was to it, you know. Nope, hair's too long. You're out. <laughs> so, yeah, back in the day. Yeah, <laughs> you know? it's like almost you were already in the military before you were. Right. So, um, I went to basic and AIT at Fort Dix, New Jersey. Bravo three five. And do you remember your drill sergeant's name? Drill Sergeant Gray, Drill Sergeant Briley. And there was another one that came in towards the end. I don't remember who that was. Still good memory. It, anyone that you served with at basic that you communicate with? No. No? No. In fact, uh, I can only remember one guy's last name is Benjamin. He was from Virgin Islands. He he was a character. We had he, a lot of fun together. As much fun as you can have in basic training, yeah. you know. Some of the things you do in basic is just like yeah. I would never have done that <laughs> if I didn't come to basic <laughs> training. Um so you're in you're in uh, Fort Dix, New Jersey and and what what year do you graduate? 77. 77? Yeah. And then your unit is in Morgantown, West Virginia, Correct. Army Reserves, as a mechanic, 63. Bravo. Bravo. Wheel, light wheel vehicle mechanic. Light wheel me- vehicle mechanic. So you graduate from basic training, and then you go back to Morgantown. Basic and AIT, and I wanted to go active duty. And they said, we can't get a release from your unit. So I got back to my unit. Told them, hey, I want to go active duty. They said, no, you can't do that until you do a year. You have to do a year. And then you can go. Now, this is reserves. So it didn't make sense to me. But what I 
did know is that if you moved, they couldn't stop you from moving. And so my dad lived in San Diego still at the time. And finding a job in Southwest Pennsylvania at that time, it was very, it always has been economically repressed. Mm -hmm. It's a poor area. (laughs) And uh, then when the coal mines and coal guns started shutting down, there was a whole lot of people looking for work and, you know, a young kid didn't stand a chance, really. Unless you wanted to work at McDonald's or something. Mm-hmm. That wasn't my forte. Yeah. So, talked to my dad. Came back to uh, Pennsylvania and I married my high school sweetheart. And they let her graduate early. She had more than enough credits to graduate. And so in, I think February of 78, we moved out to uh, San Diego. And the unit gave me a release. I had three months to find another unit. And then we got out to California and I went to uh, a recruiter. Active duty recruiter. Yeah. Well, I went, actually, I went to a Navy recruiter first. I said, okay. All right. So your prior service, what do you, what do you want to do? I said, I want to be an underwater welder. Great. Great. We need them. But. You can't do that until you're an E5. So what am I supposed to do until I'm an E5? Because I was still E1 at the time. Mm -hmm. And he said, you're going to be a boatswain's mate. I said, oh, no, I'm not. (laughs) What's a boatswain's mate? A gopher. Okay. You just, wherever they need you, you're like... The detail hero, you know. Yeah, we got a detail. Yep, send a bows, mate. So, now um, I had an uncle, it been my dad's brother in law, and he did 27 years in the Navy. And so, we talked, you know, off and on, and just talking with him, I knew a bows mate was a gopher, and I was like, no, yeah. <laughs> So I went next door and talked to uh, the army recruiter. Said, okay, well, I know the army doesn't have underwater welders, so I'm not sure this is going to last for a career. I want to be an MP. Because then, if I chose to get out, I would have that MP experience to get a job as a, as a cop someplace. Law enforcement, yeah. And back then it counted a lot. Um, almost all your small town cops were, uh, MPs, former MPs. Yep. And so I was trying to look ahead in case the career didn't pan out. And, uh, Y'all says, okay, no problem. But there's a stipulation. We can't guarantee anything because you are considered prior service because you have an MOS. But we need MPs and you're going to Fort McClellan. Okay. So I went to Fort McClellan, Alabama. That place was hot and humid it sucked. <laughs> it did. I bet. So, this is in 78. So, I've been out of basic and AIT not quite a year. N- not even a year. So, I think I went in June. And I would have graduated in September from 
basic AIT. Mm -hmm. And in June, I was back to Fort McClellan, Alabama. Well, they started a new program at that time. It's called Minuteman. Now, I know the guards is Minuteman, but yep. the active duty started uh, a program called Minuteman. It was two week basic training, basically, just to refresh. This is there was a lot of prior service guys coming back in that had got out during NOM and everything, and they were coming back in. Mm hmm. And so we, uh, I had to do two weeks basic training again, which really wasn't an issue. Uh, in fact, it was just so hot and humid and nasty. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That wouldn't be fun to, to do it when it's that hot. No. And then you have the mop training. So anyway, uh, Doing MP stuff, you know, school, commandant's list, three weeks before graduation. Drill sergeant, David had mail call, you know, we're in mm -hmm. formation. Whether you, you have formation, drill sergeant, call your name, you just drill sergeant, fall out, run around formation, yeah. get up there, get your letter. He's Davis, yep, fell out, went up. Open this up. Well, they never make you. If you got a package or something, they'd make you open it. Just make sure there was no contraband or yeah. something like that, but not a letter. Okay. So, this DA stamp on there. Open it up. And basically, I don't remember verbatim, but basically it's like, Congratulations, you've been to, selected to attend the newest MOS in the United States Army, 13 Foxtrot, Fort Sill, Oklahoma. Have a nice day. <laughs> Fallen told. What? So I get a letter to drill sergeant. Yeah, after we fall out, you stand fast. So... Continue with mail call. Dismiss the platoon. I was in Alpha 10. Was the unit I was in then. And, uh, Drill Sergeant said, Come on, let's go see the old man. Meaning, company commander. Yeah. So, company commander called battalion commander. Battalion commander called freaking uh commander of the mp school like i said i was commandant's list and everything and it's like no no <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, take some of the other slugs you know they took me up there as a full bird colonel i'm still a private so you know here i am standing in front of the colonel and like he got on the phone called Back and forth, back and forth. Finally, all right, hung up the phone. You're going to Fort Sill, Oklahoma. <laughs> yeah, you're you're now a 13 series. Because, and it all came back to, I didn't have a guarantee because I was prior service. And 13 Fox was brand new MOS. And they needed to fill it. 13 Fox was a Ford Observer. Mm hmm So. I think it's 13 Delta now. I think they changed it. I know Deltas are FDC. Yeah, I think they're... I don't know. They might be the same. But anyhow, so 13 Fox. Yeah. You go to Fort Sill, Oklahoma. What year was this? 70. Let me think. 78. 78? Yeah, because I got there like in June... And blasting through, so probably August 78. And then, uh, I was in Alpha 7, was, uh, the battery and battalion I was in for that 
as the third um, third class of 13 Fox AIT. I didn't want to be there, you know. Yeah. So when I was at McClellan, I said, what's a 13 Fox drill sergeant? What the hell do I look like? A damn MOS dictionary or library? Hell, I don't know what it is. It's artillery. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. And back then you couldn't like look at your phone. It's just like. Yeah. No. no I remember those days. <laughs> Phones were all attached to the wall still back yeah. then. <laughs> so. Uh, but, you know, settle in, just start doing it. It was so easy. I thought it was so easy. There was a lot of guys that had a lot of problems with it. But I didn't think it was hard at all. And back then, 13 Fox AIT was a lot different than in 86. Because later in my career, I ended up being an instructor at Fort Sill, Mm -hmm. 13 Fox. Totally different. And now... Well, I don't know about now because I've been retired 13 years, but the last 13 Foxes that I knew, uh, they just look at you like deer in the headlights. You know? <laughs> what? It's all so automated and te- right. the technology now. So, it, so it, is your, you went to Fort McClellan, then you went to... Fort Sill. Correct. Is your wife still in San Diego? Yes. Okay. So, yeah, she stayed out there with my dad and stepmom. So, so you, so you graduate AIT in Fort Sill? Yeah, I graduated uh, Distinguished Honor grad, which was, they only had one thing higher than that, that was Master Blaster. But to be Master Blaster, it took all your basic and AIT things and tallied them together. Okay. And since I didn't take basic training there, you know, I just took AIT. So, I said, uh, granted, I was only in third class, but I set the high record for 13 Fox at Fort Sill. At oh, time. that's so... That's cool. Good thing. You know, to got a nice hear. little letter accommodation, stuff, you know. So, I was pretty happy about that. Yeah. So, do you did you keep it? I did, but it got burned up. My house burned down here a few years ago, so. Oh, okay. Where yeah, in here was, in Leslie? Yeah, right here. This house. In June of 14 this house burned and had a rebuilt. Huh. So, what? That stinks. So you yeah, lost, lost some, a lot of stuff. But you still have the memories. Yeah. yeah. And that's why we're here. Some of them. Talking. <laughs> <laughs> that's why we're here talking today. So then you'll have a recording of it too. So, um, so you, you graduate from AIT and then at Fort Sill, then what happens after that? Sent me to Germany. We're and, at in Germany. I went into, when I flew in, I flew into Rhein-Main, which is Frankfurt. It took me down, put me on a train, and told me, do not get off this train until you get to Gerplingen. How do I spell it? What do I look like, a dictionary? Stay your ass on train. <laughs> so, do not get off. Is your wife with you? No. Yeah? No. That, was that a... It, Back then, you had to be E4 to travel, you know, to have wife travel. And it had to be command-sponsored. So, a private. Couldn't no, get married. Just, it's no. not the same today at all. But No, not <laughs> at all. So, uh, got on the train, hit one stop, and the train guy couldn't. He wasn't the train driver, but the guy checking all the tickets. Mm-hmm. Off, off, you gotta get off. Nope, 
No. <laughs> there was four of us. Two of them were going to get off because this guy was telling them get off. And two of us, no. <laughs> this is not GURP again. I don't know what this is, but it starts with an S. It's not GURP again. Yeah. <laughs> and so... <clears throat> The other two guys, they sat back down and, uh, he went up and got somebody and they came back and they told him basically just stay right there. You know, they're right. You know, let them alone. And we went to the end of the line, which was Gerplegan. That was, uh, first infantry division forward was the patch. So the big red one. The big red one. So we got off in Gurp Lagoon, did our in processing and everything. And then they sent me to Wiley Barracks in Noyon. So that's in between Stuttgart and Augsburg. Uh, Ulm is famous because of a massive church they had there. Okay. It's like the tallest spire in the world on a church. And so during World War II, they did a lot of bombing runs in there because the Danu River runs right through there. And so it was high in industry. And they uh, bombed the hell out of it. But never, they stayed two blocks away from the church, which the church, I guess, was a great landmark for them. Mm -hmm. But they stayed like two blocks away. Well, supposedly, this story that was told to me, Hitler made a big thing about biggest church in the world. They can't even hit it or anything. So they did another bomb run. But they use sacks of flour instead of bombs and just bomb like a two block radius to include the church. Just dump flour sacks on it. So it painted it white with flour sacks. But okay. Without just to say they did nothing. it. Yeah. So. Good story. So, Noyolm is right across the Danube from Ulm. It's, and Noy means new. And then Ulm is the name of the town. So he had Ulm and Noyal. So private 13 Fox. Things were a lot different back then. There was no drug test or anything. There was, there was a lot of guys from Nam. E4s from Vietnam. You know, they just mm -hmm. still under contract still. You know, so there was a lot of. So this is seventy eight. Yes. So seventy eight and Nam ended at when? Seventy five. Seventy five. Okay. Yeah. It's and there's still E fours. Huh? There's still e, they must have went there as a private and then. Yeah, or most of them been busted, or busted a few times. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Probably that makes sense. There was a whole lot of. Hash smoking going and pills and some mainline things, you know. I walked into the barracks one time, guy shooting up, you know. What do you want? I'm like, Nothing. You know, <laughs> turn around, walk back out. Carry on. <laughs> um, it, it was a different army then. then yeah. You know, we had a uh, beer, like, um, Coke machines. We had beer machines in the barracks. You know, a quarter, you get a beer. <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. But I can't imagine that. Like, with some of the troops I've had, and, like, you're like, you're the last person that should be drinking. <laughs> And you know what I'm talking about. Oh, I do. Some. I do. <laughs> You're just like, no. <laughs> I couldn't imagine like popping a quarter in there and getting a beer for some of my troops. Man. 
I never messed with the drugs or anything, but I did my share of drinking. Boy, yeah. I tell you what, it Nothing was wrong with that. It was a crazy time, you know. And what I was nineteen years old at that time. Yeah. So, yeah, I was. I was enjoying the fruits of being a soldier. <laughs> yeah, they, they had that dark, like October fest type beer. Oh yeah. But the can beer, it was nothing like you could go downtown. To go downtown, you had to have a pass, and it was just a white piece of paper that was laminated, and have your name on it. And Friday night. Tune sergeant, you call out your name, and if he called out your name, you got your pass, so you could go downtown. Even though you weren't in basic training, you couldn't. Right. No, it was a permanent party. You couldn't just it couldn't get off the concern. We weren't weren't allowed unless you had a pass. <laughs> they had MPs at the gates. They had a walk through gate not far from our barracks, and you had to show them your pass or else. You weren't getting out. So. What's well, pr- probably a good thing in some cases. <laughs> right. But there, yeah, and there was a lot of uh, venereal diseases running around at that time and everything. And they used to uh, staple condoms to the LESs, leave an earnings statement. Mm-hmm. And it's staple condom to it, you know. One, uh, whoever the CQ runner was, uh, or the orderly, whatever that was stapling them, this guy got a bright, bright idea. Instead of stapling the corner of the package, he just stapled it through the middle. So well, that's going to work. Totally. <laughs> put two holes in. in yeah, the put condom. two holes in the yeah. condom. But it didn't matter to me, but guys that always, hey, you going to use it? Cherry, you going to use it? No. <laughs> no. Give it up. All right. There, <laughs> I don't care. But then it became where you had to carry one in your wallet. Is an inspectable item? Yep. That's funny. It's just like dog tags used to be inspectable. Yep. You know, so... Friday, you had to pull out your dog tags. And you had to wear them all the time. In the civilian clothes, you still had to wear your dog tags. And you had to have your condom. And you had to have your pass. So That's crazy. Yeah. So you guys, would, when you went on pass, what did you do on pass? Let's take a quick break. Veterans Archives is a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and we rely on donations from our listeners. If you are enjoying these stories and would like to support our continued efforts, please go to www.veteransarchives.org and select the donate button. Thank you. You could do whatever you wanted. Uh, we would go downtown, and like I said, I was married. I man, I'm trying to remember how much I was making then. Probably like two hundred dollars a month. Oh, when I was when I went to basic training, I was making three nineteen a month, and that's only because I was married. So <laughs> yeah, got a few extra bucks kicker there. Yep. And then, uh, so it, it wasn't much. It wasn't over. I was not making 400 bucks a month by a long shot. I do know that. Now sending that back to California to, to my wife. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I think I keep like 20 bucks a month or something, you know, and that's what I would live on. Which could get you. A lot more than it can today. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Get you four and four beers at least. Well, <laughs> at twenty five percent, they 25%. had to mark then. 
the Deutschmark, and it was almost four to one. So almost four marks for one dollar. So if you went downtown to eat or something, you know, something might be, your meal might be two mark fifty or three marks. Well, that's less than a buck, you know, Mm -hmm. like 80 cents or something. So for a meal. Could go, that $20 can go a long way. You can make it stretch, yeah. But. I mean, it's like I didn't go downtown a whole lot or else it would have been going. You know, I could have spent it, but, you know, back then we still had black boots. So you had to buy your shoe polish. Yeah. (laughs) So, yeah, we go walk over to Nelson Concern which is where the infantry was on, on our concern. Uh, we had a artillery battalion. I can't, I don't remember who we were. We had artillery engineers and MPs. And on the other concern, Nelson concern, which was just a few blocks away, it had infantry and Pershing missiles over there but they also had the class six store we had the gym they had the class six store so so each each year had had something to offer yeah. class six is the alcohol store correct correct okay. yeah it's the liquor store and we used to go over there and we'd buy cases of uh mogan david Mogan David, is that a MD twenty twenty? Yeah, <laughs> and it's it's a great wine, but everybody calls it Mad Dog twenty twenty, or did back then <laughs> yeah. because it was thick and it was kind of rough. <laughs> yeah, but it was like ten cents a bottle, so you know you buy a case of it, man. But other guys, they would buy a little bit better wine or whatever, liquor. And we had, a, we had a rule in the room that you didn't drink until 4.30, but at 4.30 in the morning, it was lights out. And the lights were back on at 5.30. So, you know, you drink... And you had to finish whatever you were drinking. You know, you couldn't have a half bottle sitting around the room. Do you get considered contraband? Well, it yeah, it was just a health thing, you know? Yeah. Instead of having half bottles of beer or liquor or wine sitting around. It, nope, no open bottles. You could have them sealed up. But if they were open, they had to get thrown away. Huh. Just the rules. Yeah, rules. Rules have, have definitely changed. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'll be honest with you. I did PT drunk more than once. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I think a lot of a lot of service <laughs> members could say that. So, so you're in in Germany. You're in Germany from '78 to. 79. To 79. Because, well, I was, they had a wrestling team. Like I said, we had the gym. And they had wrestling. USRA had a army in Europe. It was USRA, United mm-hmm. States Army Europe. They have a, a wrestling team. And different concerns which are little posts mm-hmm. they call them concerns um, back then uh, they would put together teams and then they would have wrestle off and then that selected who got to wrestle for the army and so I was wrestling on the user team which is kind of cool you know you go to 
work in the morning. I do my 13 Fox stuff. And then at one o'clock, I report it to the gym and I wrestled the rest of the day. Oh. You know, so. It's a good way to do it. <laughs> and uh, I screwed up uh, my right knee pretty bad in a match against. Uh, we were wrestling Heidelberg University that night. And uh, a guy came in and did a single leg for a single leg takedown. And I cross faced him and broke his nose when I did. And he twitched. And when he twitched, tore up my knee. And so. They medevaced me to Augsburg Hospital, the Army Hospital in Augsburg. Okay. And uh, they operated on me December 14th, 78, on my knee. And then... They medevaced me from Augsburg to Walter Reed. And then, I can march, I think, 78 or 79. Uh, they discharged me from Walter Reed and sent me to Fort Campbell, Kentucky, 101st. Okay. Airborne Air Assault Division. So what, before you got there, were you Airborne or Air Assault? Yep. I have, yeah. Okay. I had done that in between. Bolt uh, or just one? No, I was Airborne. I wasn't Air Assault until okay. after I got there. But <laughs> I got there and I'm walking with a cane. I still have a profile. You're still 13 Fox. Still 13 Fox, still freaking private. I think so I wife's still E2. in San Diego. Yep. So, of course, when I got there, walking with a cane, got a profile, everybody is just totally down on you, you know. Oh, yeah. Profile broke and everything, so. Yeah. First time, give me a minute, you know, I just got here. Give me time. You know, I promise you, I'm not a writer, profile writer. Yep. And so he backed off and yeah, you know, I kept working on it. And let me see my time frame. My time frame is off. No, no, that's right. By June, I was leading PT for the battery. You know, I just needed a couple months to get my leg back, back up. I made PFC. And me and this uh, sergeant, his name was Washington. He was in red eye section, which was a surface to air shoulder fired missile, heat seeker. Uh huh. And that was part of the battalion. You had a red eye section. And, uh, you know, Sergeant Washington and I, we were the ones leading PT. It's a good thing to be. Yeah. So, you know, all of a sudden my, my status changed from being a profile writer to we can PT as yeah. a stud, you know. So, yeah, in that MOS series, like the the better you are at PT, the more chance of you getting promoted, right? Oh, absolutely, absolutely, and not just in the MOS, but the whole hundred first airborne air assault philosophy. You know, you you got to be a a stud in PT if you're going to do any, you know, if you're going to get any recognition, you know, so it goes from, you had to be a stud to be standard. Yep. 
<laughs> yep, two seventy and above. You get to. That's you're, the you're not on the yeah. I remember that when I was active. So, so what kind of? Uh, so you're in Fort Campbell, Kentucky, which is in what town in Kentucky is that in? I'm sorry. What town in Kentucky is that in? Uh, actually, it's Clarksville, Tennessee. Tennessee. Okay. Um, the majority of Fort Campbell, Kentucky, is in Tennessee. But the post office is on Kentucky state line side. Okay. So that's why it's called Fort Campbell, Kentucky. So you're in two states on that post. Yeah. Okay. And the vast majority of it is Tennessee. Um, the nearest town is Clarksville, Tennessee. And on the Kentucky side, it's Hopkinsville, uh, Kentucky. So southwest corner of Tennessee or Kentucky. So and in the north northeast of Tennessee. So is it mountain yeah. it's mountainy there, right? Not really mountainy. Um no. I mean you got a little rolling hills, but no mountains. Okay. Uh it's right beside land between the lakes, which is Kentucky Lake and Lake Berkeley. Okay. Um there's a peninsula that goes up in between those two big lakes. They're big. And uh, so, you know, like I said, for Kentucky, it's the southwest cor- uh, portion of it. Okay. In Tennessee, it'd be northeast. Yep, that makes sense. So, so you're 13... Or northwest, I'm sorry. So you're 13 Fox. Is there any... Like what kind of you guys go to the field there? I mean, what what was your main yeah. purpose at um, your unit? Yeah, I because I was on profile when I got there. They made me the uh, battalion fire support officer's driver. We had a jeep, M one five one jeep. That's the old. Looks like World War II mm-hmm. Vietnam era jeeps, and uh, so that's what I did. To to um, for the most part, I was his driver. So a lot of overlays, um, you know, fire plans and stuff like that. We go to the field when the grunts went. We go to the field when the artillery went, you know, um, and then I had my vehicle take care of his vehicle, but I was signed for it. Yeah. So did you guys do any air assault and airborne operations or? When I was there, uh, I went to air assault school and. Maybe August of '78, and I was student 103. I know, or 301, and got my wings, my air assault wings. So two weeks, right? Yep. Twelve mile road march to finish oh, yeah. it off. Yeah, in under three hours. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I remember. So, so you you got your air assault wings, and you already had your airborne wings, and then uh, so you did any you did mainly field problems, just training up thirteen right. fox. They, uh, I wanted to go to ranger school, and there was a lot of contention at that point in time. Like I said, there's still a lot of Vietnam vets there. And <coughs> in Nam, um, there was a lot of LERP teams. And What's a LERP team? Long range? Long range reconnaissance patrol. Okay. And there was a lot of teams from the 101st and 82nd because these guys could hump. I mean... They're, 
Now, you're light when you're with the 101st or 82nd, you're light, meaning yep. you don't have mechanized equipment. You got to walk you every walk. Yep. Yeah. And so a lot of them uh, were LERPs. Well, then, uh, and some of them actually had scrolls. Um, my former brother-in-law, he, he was, uh, alert and wore ranger scroll. And then they, uh, they were O company 75th. And then they took it away from him saying, no, you haven't been to ranger school, even though he had been doing the job, you know, yeah. everything over there. And so there became a big point of contention between Lerps and Ranger. And as it would be uh, officers and NCOs that I was dealing with, you know, they had that same point of contention. And no, you don't want to go to Ranger school. You want to be a Alert. Pathfinder. Yeah. And so they sent me to Pathfinder school. And was that a five? It was Benning. Okay, so was that a five day course? I no, can't it was remember. two weeks. Then. Two weeks. Okay. And that's really hard because you got like a repel master is basically what it is, yeah. right? And but you jump. Yeah. You don't have to jump. You don't have to be airborne to go to Pathfinder school. But you get dogged out. Yeah. I mean, they put you on the back of a deuce and a half and truck you out to the drop zone or otherwise just get in a plane jump out yeah but so it's like they consider you half a pathfinder if you weren't there you know which makes sense so as a pathfinder they're first in last out so they go into an area they set up an lz or dz whichever Troops come in, troops go out, and then they collapse the uh, the zone. I mean, pick up the lights and pick up. You know. Yeah, take march order, take care of all of that. So, and that Pathfinder motto is first in, last out. So, um, so they sent me from Campbell to that. I did a uh, PNOC, which is primary non-commissioned officers course. Now they used to be PNOC for combat arms uh -huh. and PLC for non-combat arms. PLDC when I went. Well, it was yeah. PLC at the time. Okay. Primary leadership course. We lived in the woods. They stayed in buildings on posts inside a fenced-in area. <laughs> yeah. Then uh, they combined it and made it PLDC. And then now it's Warrior Course, last I heard, or something. Warrior Leadership Course. It might be Basic Leadership Course now. I'm not sure. Yeah. So That sounds one of those. I mean, it changes over yeah. time. The name changes, but the premise is still the same, basically. But as I, I went to Pinoc and it's Pinoc slash Recondo, because it's also Recondo School Incorporated with it. So you're doing a lot of recon missions. So you, know. so you, you wore like a Recondo patch, right? Yeah, it used to be an arrowhead patch that you wore on your left pocket. It, it was a like an upside down arrow, so the arrow was pointing down, but it had the hundred first one hundred one across it. And yeah, then they changed rigs. You couldn't wear that anymore. They outlawed the patch, and you know. So anyway, I had you know I got all this stuff going on. This is after tearing up my knee and they're wanting to medical me. 
saying you'll never walk right again. Now I'm running, you know, five minute mile. Yeah. So it leading PT. It comes down to, for the most part, a lot of it comes down in my beliefs. What do you want to do? Where do you want to be? What do you want to do? So is your wife up your mind to it and do it? Yeah. So is your wife with you yet? No. No. Still not with you. She's still in San Diego. Uh, no, no. I take that back. When I went to Campbell, she, uh, I went and got her, and she came to Campbell with me. Okay, so she was there with you. So that made it definitely better. She's there, but I'm gone all the time. So. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And then, uh, and I, I was not making much money there either, even as a spec four, PFC spec four, because I would sell plasma twice a week if I wasn't in the field. Um, right outside gate four, which is the main gate at Fort Campbell. And it's right on the state line, Tennessee, Kentucky state line. <laughs> but uh, right across the street from it was a plasma center. And if you you went in and sold plasma, you know, you go in, they stick a needle in your arm, dr- drain off a pint of blood, go put in a centrifuge so the plasma separated. They would skim that off and then put the whole blood back in. So back in you? Yeah. Yeah, it's my blood, so you know, yeah. it wasn't no big deal. But that's how they got plasma, <laughs> which is a life saving thing. You know, it's yeah. platelets and everything, so it helps clog up wounds and stuff. Yep. So Makes sense. you got five dollars for the first time you did. If you did it a second time in that week, that was ten dollars. So that's fifteen bucks a week. Which is a lot of money then. Four weeks in a in a month, that's uh sixty bucks. And I still wasn't making four hundred bucks a month. I know that. That's insane. And this is what year? Seventy nine. Still seventy nine. Yeah, so. it's not very much. It's hard to live off that. Yeah, well, they opened up uh, right on the Kentucky side of the straight line, uh, state line. They opened up new apartments, and I don't know how, but we lucked out and got in one of those. We had been renting a little house down in Tennessee, and man, it was just so horrible. You walk in the house and have white tennis shoes on, white socks or whatever, and it turned black with fleas. And you just oh, wow. could not get rid of them. Just couldn't. I mean, literally, looked like you had black shoes or black socks on. It just, it was horrible. So, we ended up... Uh, and that's that, that's government housing? No, no. As a private, you're not authorized government housing at that point. Uh, okay. You had to be an E4 and get sanctified by command to get housing. Oh. Now it's a PFC still, so. Yeah. Uh, anyway, they just got done with uh, state line apartments. It's right across from the. Is it Win Dixie or Piggly Wiggly? Something yeah, like Piggly that. Wiggly. <laughs> yeah. But got in there and it cost $187.50 a month. The apartment was actually $185. But you rent a vacuum cleaner for the month for $250. So it made it $187.50 a month. Is it because you rented a vacuum cleaner? But. You know, I sold plasma twice a week, four times, you know, 60 bucks, you know? Yep. And this is, how old are you at this point? Rent. How old are you at this point? Uh, 
Well, I turned 20 in in July of 79. Okay. So. So, you, I'm sorry, go ahead. There, there was a lot going on, you know? Yeah. Um, January... Third, nineteen eighty. Most of my time at Fort Campbell, I spent on DRF, Division Reactionary Force, and you had fifteen minutes to be at your barracks if they called. And so, lucky for me, I lived just outside the main gate, and so. And they would do drills. They would call you up. Yeah, just randomly, just to and check on it. There was no cell phones back then. They'd call your house. Now, if we went to a grocery store or something, they, I would have to call in and say, I'm going to Piggly Wiggly. I'll call you when I get there. <laughs> as soon as you get to the store... You have to find out the number to the store. Then you call them back and say, I'm at Piggly Wheatley. This is the phone number. That's crazy. And then when you got ready to leave the store, I'm leaving Piggly Wiggly, heading home. I'll call you when I get home. And that's the way it was. I mean, that's your life when you were on DRF. And. So, December 3rd, 1980, about 2.30 in the morning, I get a phone call, and there, there was a code word, and it changed all the time, and at that point, it was longest mile. Ring! Phone rings. Yeah. Longest mile. Roger that. That meant... You got 15 minutes, clock's ticking. So, you know, quick throw on the uniform, jump in my car, bam, get in, sign in to the barracks. Or the orderly room. Yeah. Um, sometimes they call you up, say, all right, just checking. Sometimes they call up, longest mile, you go in. You'd sign in and say, okay, go home. Sometimes you would go in, sign in. They'd tell you, draw your weapon, go down to the grunts. So, you go down there, the grunts say, okay, go home. Sometimes, call you in, go down to the grunts, go out to the airfield, sit on the tarmac. Sometimes you'd load up. Sometimes the plane would take off. You just never knew. You know? Yep. Well, January 3rd, 1980. About 2.30-ish in the morning. Longest mile. Went in. Draw your weapon. Get down to the grunts. Go down there. Get out to the airfield. Get on the plane. Plane took off. Eight hours later, we landed in Panama. <laughs> okay that's like, and it was cold jeez it was so cold when we took off there was ice over everything it was an ice land it really was you know we had hoar frost hanging from the trees it's where the frost just builds up and makes like icicles yeah but it's frost so you get to Panama and what's your mission um Got to Panama, it was a deployment FTX. And so we landed in Howard Air Force Base, which is on the Panama City side. We didn't know we were going to Panama. I said, it was icy when we took off. And about seven hours into the flight, it starts getting warm. And like, Oh, it only took you seven hours to find a heater button. Yeah. And you were back here freezing. And, man, it just starting to get hot, 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 hot. 
everybody's taking off field jackets and <coughs> it landed how Howard Air Force Base on uh Panama City side. And as we're taxiing down the runway, they start dropping the ramp. We were on a C-130. Start dropping the ramp. I'm looking out, and there's more shades of green than I ever knew existed. And it's like, oh, we are not a camel. Because <laughs> no. it was ice when we left, and it didn't get this green in eight hours. So... Got off the plane, got on deuce and a halfs. It took us from Howard Air Force Base to Empire Range, which was Army Artillery Range. Right next door, just a chain link fence separating the two. Mm -hmm. Got there. There was uh, a plateau, and it was just... GP large tents set up as far as you could see. The sides were rolled up, but the tent was there. Just as far as you could see. And, uh, because it was a whole brigade. They moved out, 3rd Brigade. And so we're getting off the truck. And, uh, guys, it's Sergeant Thomas. Yeah, that was my FO. Mm -hmm. 13 Fox? Yeah. Sergeant, you're going to that building over there. All the rest, you keep going over there. Keep going. Well, he's going that way. So I start following him. And this Sergeant hollers at me. Private Warden, think you're going. <laughs> That's my FO where he goes. And FO stands for Ford Observer. I was his RTO, radio telephone operator. Mm -hmm. So we had four pieces of communications, three radios and one secure unit. Well, he carried two, I carried two. And I said, where he goes, I go. I didn't tell you to. And then Sergeant Thomas said, hey. If he doesn't go that way, I don't go that way because he's got half my communications. All right, go. So we went and we linked up with some some guys. And so we are down in Panama. All right. So they separated Sergeant Thomas and me from all the rest of the guys that were on the deuce with us they linked us up with some uh other guys a small team of five and we did two weeks of indoctrination just getting our pace count down for in the jungle because it's a lot different based on the terrain um took us out on a lcm which is the old john wayne boat you always see um in World War II, when D-Day, mm -hmm. the fronts dropped down. Yeah. Took us out in the middle of the canal, dropped down the bow, and kicked us off. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> and swam back to shore. So, anyway, uh, we spent some time in the jungle, and then we came back out. Uh, that was the beginning of the war on drugs against the cartel. Three Cabo years Escobar. later, the Army went down yeah. for the Noriega deal. So it was three years before Noriega stuff. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah, I remember exactly what you're... I mean, I was a little baby then, but um, <laughs> I, I know what you're talking about at that time in history. And that was... Nor, there was Noriega, and then there was uh, Pablo Escobar, but Escobar was Colombia. Yeah. Okay. And so we came back to Campbell and I got uh, orders to Alaska from Fort Campbell. So a PCS to 
uh, Fort Richardson, Alaska. I was the uh, 172nd Light Infantry Brigade at the time. And so, you, so you're going to Alaska. What's the year? Uh, 1980. 1980? Yeah. And you were Sergeant E5? Oh, when I left Campbell, I was promotable. Okay. And so E4 promotable or? Yes. Okay. E4 promotable. And my number had just came up and I was working with chief over at uh personnel, the chief warrant officer to get my order so I could show up to Alaska wearing my E5. And I'll put them in the mail today. I'll mail them to your dad because that's where I was going on leave. Mm-hmm. So, got out there and was checking every day, you know, and one day they showed up. So, I stopped at Fort Lewis, Washington, bought some Me 5 pins, got up to Alaska, August 22nd, I believe, 1980, and uh, pinned them on and reported in. Oh, you're a sergeant. Yes, I am. I have my orders in my pocket just in case. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I said, well, great. Here's your team. So they gave me a fist team. Brand new E5. <laughs> yeah, was, in Alaska where there's polar bears. and. Well, we didn't see no. They are way up north. So we never saw any polar bears. A lot of brown bears and grizzlies. Yeah. Where's, bears. where's Fort Richardson? Anchorage. Anchorage? Yeah. And then Fort Wainwright is up at Wainwright. Okay. So, about the center of the state. So, uh, I had my team up there, and we lived in the field. Uh, every time the infantry would go, we would go. Every time the mortars would go, we would go. Every time the artillery would go, we would go. And when it was a mass consolidation, you know, major field training exercise, we would go, you know, so lived in the field. Then, uh, (coughs) we were doing great things. And they had a indoctrination school up there called Snowhawk Fledgling. And every battalion had to give up instructors for the survival school. And Master Sergeant Waldrop was the NCOIC. There was no officer. It was under uh, the NCO Academy was our higher headquarters. And so it was just NCOs. But you didn't teach nothing. You didn't say a thing until you got blessed off by the other instructors. Consequently, him mm-hmm. before you do anything. And if you couldn't cut it, they'd send you back to the battalion. Then there was holy hell to pay because yeah, make it. the battalion sent yeah. somebody that was substandard. So they... Snatched me up and sent me over, which kind of upset me because now I had this team, and it's supposed to be a seven man team with a lieutenant and a staff sergeant. Mm-hmm. I was the only team that did not have a lieutenant, and I was a buck sergeant. I was I was in hog heaven, man. I was yeah. off the hook. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, anyway, they sent me over there. So, I was an instructor over there. Then, uh, they had a change of brigade commander. Brigade commander was a brigadier general because it's a brigade separate. And the new commander came in and he decided didn't need a survival school. First line leaders ought to be teaching all that stuff, but the problem is who teaches the first line leaders about frostbite, hypothermia, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. 
All the cold weather stuff. Right. And so it did away with school. And that winter, I forget what percentage, like 30% more cold weather injuries than there had been in however many years prior. It was ridiculous. Just everybody rotated in and nobody knew. So then uh, they shut down the school. I went back, took over my team again. Doing great things. They decide they're going to open up air assault school. Well, they need qualified air assault guys to be instructors at the air assault school. And a lot of them that were out there, they knew me because I'd been their instructor when they came through Snowhawk Fledgling, the survival school. And so they pulled me out there. So I was an air assault school instructor. We only did one cycle up there because it just got too cold. The prop wash and everything. It just got too cold. You couldn't do it. Yeah. And birds would have ice on them and stuff like, you know, they couldn't fly. So we did one cycle. Now I went back to the artillery. Took over my team again. Uh, became E5 promotable in PCS from there to Fort Knox, Kentucky. And Fort Knox, Kentucky, that was the 194th Armor Brigade separate. I hated that place. Loved the off duty. Like, you know, hunting, fishing, everything. Yep. I hated the army down there. <laughs> yeah. Elizabethtown was... Yeah. Well, the main main job down there was supporting the armor school. And so, I'm an E5P. I'm standing there as the platoon sergeant. My first day there... 13 Fox. Oh, you're in third platoon here. Platoon Sergeant's on leave. So I go out there. I'm supposed to have like 65 guys. And there is 12 standing there. Time to report. All present count of four. All present or count of four. All present or count. There are 65. Where's everybody else? There are 12 here. So uh, me being who I was. Go down the list, name by name, armor school, armor school, armor huh. school. What are they doing at the armor school? Answering telephones and handing out weapons for the basic training because Fort Knox at that time Had basic was training. home of the armor. And so if you were armor or scouts or cav, that's where you went. So yeah, nineteen kilo was the MLS. Right. Yeah, I remember kilos, deltas, and so yeah, I just really hated Fort Knox, the Army of Fort Knox. Mm-hmm. Like I said, after duty, it was great. So I did my time there. Uh, I requested drill sergeant status. Because at that point, if you were not a drill sergeant or recruiter, you can hang it up for seven. The DA wouldn't even look at you for seven. So, I did not have the mentality or the forte to be a recruiter. A little too brash, Mm -hmm. I guess. (laughs) But... So I re- uh, requested drill sergeant school, and they had drill sergeant school right there. So, okay, went drill sergeant school. Eight weeks. Twelve. Twelve weeks. Well, the first four was what they called a DSOC, drill sergeant orientation course. So you go through basic training for four weeks. 
everything you do in basic training, you did there, but in four weeks. Yeah. <laughs> so then if you made it through DSOC, then drill sergeant school started and that's eight weeks. So there was a uh, hundred modules. This is the way the school was broke down. And some of the modules only had one task. Some of them had seven tasks. And you would never, when you would go up to test on, test on module, we'll just say 53, just pulling a number on it. There may be seven tasks in there, but they wouldn't have you do all seven tasks. They would just pick four. And so, but you never knew which one or what, you know. So if you and I were both testing on module 53, I would get these four tasks and you might only get three tasks and be oh. the other three, or you might get four and maybe two would overlap or whatever. You just never knew. Yeah. And so, uh, I graduated. I ended up doing, I, I said, I'd, did 103 modules because I got three no goes. <laughs> yeah. So, yep. I know how that goes. And I got you, them too. you may have four tasks, but if you get one no go in any of those four tasks, that module is a no go. And so, and it was verbatim back then. Exactly what the book says. And if you substitute a word or you know, have, Instead of will, that's a no go. <laughs> that's crazy. So, I mean, it was memorization to the T. And so I graduated. They sent me to Fort Sill, Oklahoma to do my drill time. I would drill sergeant in Charlie 7 at Fort Sill, Oklahoma. So, still married. To my first wife, my oldest son was born when we were in Alaska. Okay. Um, What's your born, oldest son's name? George Christopher. George I'm Christopher. Chris. And what yeah. year was that? April 6, 81. 81. Okay. And he was born in Elmendorf Air Force Base. It was Fort Richardson and Elmendorf Air Force Base. They're the same compound it's just or same post same base just a chain link fence mm -hmm. so the air force had the hospital there up at fort wainwright the army had the hospital up there so the air force went to fort wainwright so my i said my oldest son he was born at elmendorf air force base anchorage alaska so, we moved down to Fort Knox, moved out to Fort Sill, and I was a drill sergeant for Charlie 7, which was a MOSET, you know, multiple one-station unit training, so multiple yeah. MOSs in the same battery. And I had 13 Foxes, which was right up my alley. Yeah. So, you know, you pick them up and you start going through all the basic training stuff with them and everything. But I would be steady injecting 13 Fox stuff into them without them even knowing, I'm, you know, land nav. It just tied into 13 Foxes. You have to be able to read a map and everything. So, um, doing great things and then Fort Sill uh, decided to change back to the old way to where you had basic training in this unit and AIT in that unit. Mm -hmm. So they sent me to Echo 6 and sent all 13 Foxes from 6th train battalion. Well, 6th didn't have Foxes, but 7th and 8th train battalion had 13 foxes. They sent 
all 13 foxes to Echo 6. And they were mine. I had 200 and some privates. That's a lot of privates. <laughs> a lot. You definitely were busy. A lot. And then, until things got weeded out, you know, 7th Train Battalion became the basic training battalion. And 8th Train Battalion became AIT Battalion. Well, as 8th Training Battalion got rid of their AIT students, then they just filled with basic training. And, or, uh, AIT students. And as the 7th emptied out, they just filled with basic training. So the troop would go to basic training in the 7th, graduate, and then go over to the 8th for AIT. So I was the bridge in between while all that got sorted out. And so, um, uh, as my soldiers started graduating, my numbers went down because now they're off permanent party. And so they started injecting other MOSs into uh, computer repair, uh, encryption repair. And they would go to school 24 hours a day. You know, like eight students, eight of them would go in the morning. And then eight in the afternoon, eight at night, because there's only so many computers for them to work on. Yeah. You know, so they they weren't going to take 50 computers and tear them up to have 50 students put them back together. They just rotated. Makes sense. And the same thing with secure equipment. And so I was doing PT three times a day. You know, it just... It was great. <laughs> <laughs> Being best a shape of your life was one of the best jobs I had in the army, and everybody says, "Yeah, because you get to screw with people all the time." And that was such a small part of it. I mean, it's a huge part in every soldier's life. Everybody remembers it. But the reason it was so great is because on day one you get this soldier, this recruit. That's never been away from home, even overnight. Or he did, he snuck out or whatever. And eight weeks later, they're walking across the stage, young soldiers. You know, and then eight weeks after that or whatever, however long the AIT mm -hmm. was, you know, now you got a soldier. You know, that job knowledge and everything. Granted, basic level, but nonetheless. Yeah. yeah, as a recruiter, I know what you're saying. Cause you, like you go into high school, at yeah. least I would, and then it, then you send them to basic. You see them like who they were before and then who they were after, and it's such a change. Huge. Huge change in them for the better. Now, granted, you have the ones that aren't that. You know, there's <laughs> yeah. the ones that come in and, and like, they literally, like me, I was in trouble all the time and came in the Army and I... I mean, I've had issues with little things since, but, you know, just it changes you. Not you can, that I remember. Well, like speeding <laughs> tickets or, you know, something like that. I think I, I think I had a noise complaint in college. <laughs> I think that's the worst thing I had. Um, but, yeah, so I know exactly what you're yeah. saying. Being able to make an impact on someone's life is huge. Right. So I did – what. Drill status is two years. And at that time, you could request a third year. At uh, a year and a half mark, you could request a year extension. And so you'd be a drill sergeant for another year. And uh, when I first started, I was all about that. But the Army changed so much. And one battalion commander in particular that I had is like, 
no, I'm I'm done with this, boy. Yeah. As soon as I get away, we've all had the better. <laughs> so, I got divorced while I was a drill sergeant. Um, got divorced, and then uh, my youngest son was born, and. Uh, Pennsylvania. She left Fort Sill and went back to Pennsylvania. And my my youngest son, he was born on uh, October eighth of eighty six. So you have two two kids total. Two sons. Okay, two yeah. sons. Joshua Patrick is my youngest son's name. So. I came, you know, I did my two years on drill status, came off drill status, October 86, and I was ready to go back to a T.O.N.E. unit, you know, regular artillery unit, but they had other thoughts for me. They sent me over to the gunnery house to be a 13 Fox AIT instructor. Okay. <laughs> so, well... We're not getting rid of you so, on Fort Sill. Yeah, basically, I'm still working with privates, just like when I was a drill sergeant. Just I'm not getting paid to drill pay for it now. <laughs> yeah. So I did that a little over a year. I went to uh, just after I came off drill status. I went to ANOC. And that was very disappointing. Um, it what's the ANOC is advanced, advanced non commissioned okay. officers course, so it's the E seven course. But I went as a staff sergeant as an E six. They had an opening, I got in and it was very disappointing. Uh there was four of us, thirteen foxes. And the three of them were sevens. I was a six. I said I was doing PT three times a week or three times a day, you know, seven days, six days a week. Got over there. They gave us the initial PT test. Failed us. Failed everyone? Well, four of us. I had never failed a PT test in my life. Huh. And it was a two, two, two minute push up, two minute sit up, two mile yeah. run. Yep. Fell down push ups. And I always max my push ups. Well, they failed us, but we did not have to do remedial PT. Everybody else that failed had to do remedial PT, but we didn't have to. Like, what's up with that? I mean, did PT just like everybody else in the morning, but didn't have to do remedial. And, uh, and this, you know, when class, when we were ready to graduate, you have to do a PT test again. And now we're all getting 300s, which we were doing before. And it was like a claim to fame. Look what we did with these guys. You know, took them from failures yeah, to 300. And, oh, boy, it just really, really, really stuck in my craw. Well, obviously, he still does. So, yeah. <laughs> you know. Um, so, I went, uh, while I was. What year was this? That was in 86. 86. 87. Summer of 87. Okay. So, summer 87, ANOC. Right. And then you you, you graduate from ANOC, and how long I'm, before you get? Well, I was still an instructor at gunnery department. Okay. And so, I ended up going to TAC fire school. Because the commandant of the gunnery department asked me a question, and I had no clue what he was talking about. He said, Sergeant Davis, don't play with me. I know you know the answers. I have no clue. It's about subscriber tables for TAC fire. 
I have no clue what you're talking about, sir. You know? Oh, you went to... I've never been to school. I've never seen tack fire, let alone know anything about it. So that shook him up. And he, next week, I was in tack fire school. <laughs> <laughs> so graduated tack fire school. And they sent me to uh, back to Germany. Uh, Same place? No. Uh, sent me to Bomb Holder which was the 8th Infantry Division. But fire support was forward deployed. So we lived with the infantry or armor on different concerns. So I ended up uh, being down in uh, Mannheim. Is that uh, a better better location than where you, where you were before? Well, at that time it was. Yeah, yeah it was. It was a lot better because you had Mannheim, you know, which is a major city right there. So it was, uh, it was good. Now I was a staff sergeant promotable at the time. So I ended up, uh, making E7. When I made E7, I took over a armor platoon, armor fist platoon. And, uh, it was a great tour. My, my second tour was a great tour. And that was, I was over there from, uh, 87 to 90. So desert storm and shield happened while I was over there. Uh, the wall came down while I was over there. Oh, really? Yeah. And the unit I was in was a nuke capable, uh, artillery battalion. And so, you know, I was nuke surety and all this stuff, you know, codes and everything. So, I was not allowed within 50 miles of the border unless it's on a major training exercise, you know, where everybody was around. I just couldn't go like, um, to Berlin or anything like that. I wasn't allowed. So, so why weren't you allowed? Because you're, because I had new codes in my head. Oh, okay. That's what I thought you were <laughs> going to say, but so, and that was a lot of memorizing too, because they had changed the codes periodically, you know. And so now you got to learn all of these new codes. So, so you you were like, yeah. like a extreme at secret agent <laughs> asset for the army. Yeah, it was top secret nuke surety clearance. So, and so uh, when they when they say secret squirrel, they're referring to you. <laughs> Kind of sort of because I'm always looking for nuts, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, it was great. I had uh, my Harley over there at the time, and I basically did all of Western Europe on my Harley. And predominantly by myself, some trips... You know, we did with friends, but a lot of it I just did by myself. So, what a lot of people don't realize is it used to be East Germany and West Germany. In West Germany, everybody thinks it was so huge. It was only about the size of the state of Washington. What, what was the difference between the two? So, you said the wall comes down. Okay, that was so the separator, right? East and West Germany. Germany used to be one country until the end of World War II. And then Germany got divided in half. And the Soviet bloc got the eastern half. NATO got the western half. So it became East Germany, West Germany. And there was a physical wall built 
and checkpoints to where they could not come to the west, but the west couldn't go to the east. Nobody wanted to go to the east, but, you know, the wall was to keep people in East Germany. And uh, it was Ronald Reagan told Gorbachev, Mr. President, tear down this wall. You know, this because you had families on both sides of the wall, but they could never see each other. That's crazy. It just, it was an arbitrary line that was drawn after World War II to split it between Soviet Union and NATO. So, in the Soviet Union, everybody thinks that was Russia. Russia was the head of the Soviet Union, but it encompassed all kinds of countries. You know, Czech, the Czech Republic, as it's known now, but they combined it to Czechoslovakia. They combined two countries, um, Poland, you know, right down through um, Lithuania, where the war is going on. I'm drawing a blank right yeah, now. Yeah, no. Um, yeah, a lot of this stuff, I, I mean, I've, I've heard it, but I didn't know yeah. exactly what happened. So they they brought the wall down because... Right. Literally, wrote, physically, they broke down the wall. And all these people from East Germany just flooded the West, along with a lot of Russians. They wanted out of there. They wanted out of that communist life. Mm-hmm. You know? Well, that had some serious, serious impact on West Germany. As West Germany, democracy, you know, Social Security, basically, you know, they're a form of it and everything. And all these people came across. Well, now they have uh, East German marks, which was 10 East German marks equaled one West German mark. But... To keep things fair, they did a one-for-one one exchange, which really just drove the economy for West Germany into a hole. All these people came over. Now they're getting social medicine, but they've never paid into it. It's a massive drain. You know, so that yeah. was all political yeah. stuff over there, but... Uh, second and 29th Field Artillery who I belonged to, even though I was forward deployed. Uh, They went to Desert Storm. And they left all 13 foxes behind because the infantry and armor did not go because of all the European stuff going on. The wall and everything. Mm -hmm. So we left a tangible force in Germany. They uh, sent a few 13 foxes down there. And 2nd and 29th Field Artillery was the first unit to fire a copperhead round in war. And copperhead round is a laser guided field artillery round. So. Yeah. I remember those. Um, and what what year is this? This is nineteen ninety. Nineteen ninety. So, uh, Saddam's still alive. <laughs> oh yeah. 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 So anyway, I went down there for a couple weeks, and then I was back in Germany. They just took some of us down for the initial blast two weeks later we were back in Germany just because of the way we were steamrolling them yeah the the Republican National Guard is that right was that right the Republican National Guard and so got back to Germany um 
PCS from Germany to Fort Carson, Colorado. I got Fort Carson, Colorado. I was a Sergeant First Class. Um, I was the division targeting NCO for the 4th ID, 4th Infantry Division. So, uh, I was Alpha Battery 26 Tab, Target Acquisition Battery. So, as a targeting NCOIC for the division, I stayed with the radar. That's what the tab battery was. And so I'm working with all these radar guys and everything. And it was, it was pretty cool. And, uh, ended up that one of my best friends, he was a drill sergeant, same time I was, I heard his voice one day. Was, we shared a building, but the walls weren't solid. They only went up so far and then it was just chicken wire up yep. above that you know, cage basically. But I heard his voice and I knew that was him. And I hollered at him, who's that? And so, you know, it was just a really nice reunion. Yeah. Small, small army, right? Yeah. So, cause he had been, uh, Pershing missiles, but when they did away with Pershing, he went, to uh, radar I think that's how it worked out anyway so radar is now just signal yeah yeah that's I mean that's all it is now I think yeah it, it belonged to Devardi at the time division artillery is who uh, radar used to belong to yeah but uh, I learned a lot about radar that I never knew, you know, I learned that if you, uh, hang a hot dog in front of the radar and they Q, which turn on Q means turn on the radar. And it's only about a three second blast. Otherwise they can be identified real easy. So they turn it on. Three seconds, turn it off. That hot dog would be cooked. You know, just... <laughs> really? <laughs> One cue. Yeah. Can you eat it? Or? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's a microwave. It's just... Just like the ones in the house. Except, That's funny. Yeah. You so you were fine in the field. You just took some hot dogs. And <laughs> as long as you could keep them cold, you'd be good to go. So... While I was at Fort Carson, the Army, uh, the Gulf War ended. First Gulf War. What What year is this? When is it? Uh, 95. 92. 92? Well, 91, but um, the powers that would be uh, executive branch. Of the United States decided, or, you know, the military is too big. Got to cut down the military. Yep. And so the army had to cut thirty thousand soldiers by one October ninety two. And so they put a blanket bar to reenlistment on. And this blanket bar it was based on rank. MOS and time in service. And it was different for different things. But I hit right in it. I was a E7, 15 years active, 13 Fox. I was promotable at the time. I already had a number for E8. But I was not an E8. I was still E7. And so, uh, you had a choice. You could take the money and run, as they called it, and 
based on how many years service you had and everything, they gave you a exit bonus, if you will. They paid you to leave. Or you can stick around and take your chances that they wouldn't, that they would get enough for that 30000 and you wouldn't get caught up in it before your ETS state. Yeah, it's a strange place, a hard place to be in. Yeah. I took the money and ran because I would have too. My uh, my ETS wasn't until February, and I, I just didn't have that kind of faith, and so if, it, if something can go wrong, it will go wrong, right? right. <laughs> And that's been my luck. (laughs) I've not been lucky at a lot of things. Staying alive is one. But (laughs) that's... Anyway, uh, so I came off active duty. uh, 2nd of September, 92. Moved to South Dakota. I had remarried by this time. Uh... When I was in Germany, she was a soldier. She ets and Where was she from? South Dakota. Okay. So, uh, got the car and she went up to South Dakota. So, when I got out, I went up to South Dakota. And uh, took the money that I got and bought a house. Bought some land, but uh, man, it was just hard to find, hard to find a job up there. Again, very economically repressed. A lot of wheat farmers and corn and stuff up there. Uh, I finally got a job. I what. I didn't know where I was going, so when I came off active duty, I joined the IRR, which is Individual Ready Reserve. So, unlike reserves or guards, you don't drill every month, but you have to fill out a a card saying, this is where I live and everything. So, if they need to, they can activate you. Well... Moved to South Dakota, got a job at a place called Intercept. What did you do at Intercept? I hired in as a woodcutter. Just, um, they built insulated panels for houses and buildings. And so I would cut the wood for studs that would go inside of these panels or I'd cut the OSB which was the outside of the panel and then they'd take a layer of OSB put some studs in there and then fill the rest with styrofoam and then put another layer of OSB on it so it was a wall and you just set it up and hooked them together so, I was making seven forty-five an hour, which is not a lot of money. No, not a lot of money. And uh, I just started there, and like, oh, you're, you know, you're doing great at wood cutting. We're gonna move you over here now. And so they moved me, and then I got. Activated by the IRR. And this is what year? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, I'm what year at is this? this? Place like uh, ninety two. Still ninety two. So, no, it was ninety three. It was like March of ninety three. I got activated, and they sent me to Fort Indian Town Gap, Pennsylvania, and worked at range control there. So, I'm a sergeant first class still. Got out there. I'm looking at all of these range books and everything. It's like, 
who did these up? Oh, they've been here forever. We, yeah, but you have 80-inch artillery illumination. Well, yeah. Why would you have that? So when 8-inch artillery fires illumination rounds, we know... Okay, there's one huge problem with that. There's no 8-inch. There is no 8-inch art or illumination round. No, we still had 8 inches. Okay, at the time you did. But they they were being phased out and replaced with MLRS. Yeah. But 8 inch never had an illumination round. The velocity was just too high. It would rip the chutes off of them. I mean, they tested them out of Fort Sill, but they were never in the inventory. But somebody, oh, we got eight inch illumination. So how they came up with this overlay, you know, range safety data, I have no clue. But, you know, then everybody started telling me I was crazy. I didn't know what I was talking about and everything. <laughs> okay, educate me. Oh, you educate yourself. Well. The OIC heard us, the colonel, so he comes out. What's wrong? There's no such thing as 8-inch artillery or illumination rounds. Yes, there is. The other guy, you know. I worked on the guns. I've humped those things. I said, well, your chief lied to you because they weren't illumination rounds. And besides that, Eight inch artillery round is two hundred and seventeen pounds. Yeah, you didn't hump that by yourself. No. Yeah. So anyway, all of a sudden, and this guy kind of knows what he's talking about here, you know. So. That's really heavy, two seventeen. It was ninety eight pounds for a one five five. Right. Ninety eight is for a one five five AG. Like, like forty six for a for a 105. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. But, so, anyway, you know, I got to sit on in there doing great things. They kept me until freaking October. <laughs> yeah. It's more active duty time, right? It was. So, they sent me back to South Dakota. So, now I go back to Intercept where I worked for three months before getting yanked away all summer long. Now it's coming into winter season, so I worked like a month and a half, and they laid me off because business just drops to basically nothing in the winter time out there. Does it snow a lot? Oh, oh yeah. Oh yeah. It's a lot of a lot of like tribal communities, right? There, there's a lot of uh, reservations out yeah. there. Yeah. But very few trees, so that wing is blowing. And it a calm day in South Dakota is 25 mile an hour wind. Oof. That's a calm day. And then you put the temperature and the snow on top of it. You know, every, every year there would be pictures of a barn and you'd see a cow standing up on top of the barn. But on the back side of the barn, it was nothing but a big snow drift where the snow <laughs> kept blowing and blowing and blowing. Yep. And get crusted over and cows would just end up walking up there. So anyway, I decided, you know, I had too many years. Because now I'm going on 16 years active. It's like, I got too many years just to throw this away. And so you're just trying to hit sanctuary. <laughs> no, that wasn't the game plan. No. I, I, But I joined the South Dakota National Guard. Because I figured, even if I do the Guard, when I'm 60, I'll have some kind of military retirement. Mm-hmm. And so... South Dakota Guard, they sent me out to Fort Lewis, Washington. Well, there is a contingent 
of us that went out to Fort Lewis, Washington. We worked with the Australians out there. Sergeant Major Tony Fagan was the point of contact for me out there. He was <laughs> he was a good guy, really good guy. And what but, year were you in? And huh? what year was it that you went to Washington? Ninety four. Ninety four. Okay. Ninety five when I went to Washington. Ninety five. Joined the guard in ninety four. Went to Washington in ninety five. Came back. No, it was 96 when I went to Washington. Came back. I moved to Michigan from South Dakota. Got divorced. Moved to Michigan from South Dakota. Uh, okay. So you're in Got Michigan. Got divorced. Was single for a long time. Got Married to the third wife, and she was from here, so she could not handle South Dakota, so we moved back to Michigan. Did you meet her in South Dakota? Actually, she was a very good friend of mine. We were stationed in Alaska, Fort Knox, and in Germany together. It was his sister, so. Okay. So, you know, one day out of clear blue, she called me and. Like I said, I've been single for a while in South Dakota. We ended up getting married, moved back here to Michigan. My first drill. Are you 13 Fox? or? Yeah, I was still? 13 Fox. But when I joined South Dakota Guard, they took me from an E7 down to E5. Oh. Made back my six like in two months. Made back my seven. I did a interstate transfer to Michigan. And I looked it up and there was two artillery battalions in Michigan. One was the 119th. The 118th. And they were 105 towed. The other was the Deuce, 182nd, and they were 155 SP, 109 SP. I never have liked mechanized. Never. So much of the budget goes to maintenance. Mm -hmm. There's no training. Time. The only training you get is maintenance. That's it. Replacing tracks. Mm -hmm. yeah. So... I said, nope, I'm going to the toad. So I called 119th and talked with Captain Sam Dahlman. I remember him. And he was the OIC of the 119th at yep. Marshall Street. I said, hey, sir, I'm doing this IST. You know, I want to do an IST from South Dakota there. He said, give me a quick rundown. 13 Fox since third class. Been to Germany twice. Alaska. Last duty station active. I was a fourth ID uh, targeting NCO. We can use you if you'll go to warrant school. Or the targeting officer. We have a warrant targeting slot. I'll go to warrant school. I won't go commission, but I'll go to warrant school. All right. So got the battalion commander to sign off on it, which was Peters Peterson, Colonel Peterson brought me in as an E seven. My second drill here, South Dakota called him and said, hey, we need him back out in Fort Lewis, Washington. We'll pay for it and everything. So, all right. So, Sam Dahlman and powers that would be, they cut me loose. I had orders from South Dakota. Active duty orders? Yeah. Okay. 
flew flew out of uh yeah, up north flew out of a little tiny rinky dink airport out to Fort Lewis, Washington. I was out there for about six weeks and then came back and uh so where were you living at in Michigan when you came to Michigan? Manistee. Oh, okay. Yeah, you're west side of the state. Yeah, up north of Ludington. Yep. South of Traverse City. So that's where my buddy, whose sister I married, that's where they were living. He's retired on me. And uh, so we were staying up there. And then... I couldn't beg a job up there. I couldn't. Or you're walking. I just needed. I was paying child support. I needed money. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, walked into damn gas station up there. Had a little convenience store with it. Big help wanted sign in the window. I get an application. Application for what? For the job. What job? You got a big help wanted sign. Oh, you're not from around here, are you? I am now. Yeah, there's no job. We just leave that sign up there. So it's pretty much a birthright to get a job in northern Michigan. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Yeah. If you don't know somebody that's been there forever, you know, it's hard to get a job. So I moved down to Lansing, did a lot of ADSW, Mm -hmm. ended up being a first sergeant for headquarters battery, 119th. I was there until uh, Guantanamo hit. And... Which is 2000, we got, like September 2003 is when we got an activation order. Right. Yeah. But I was not supposed to go to Guantanamo because the 119th had another mission in Europe. And they were sending me back there because I could talk German. You know, I'd been in Europe, all over Europe. He said, no, (laughs) you know the rules, so you're going back over there. I said, okay. And... At that point, I was a plant supervisor at a tannery in Leslie, um, a hide tannery. So we did tannery for taxidermists. What, so so what on tannery? What's what is tannery? I don't understand what that is. Somebody shoots a deer; they want to get it stuffed. Okay. They'll take the hide. To a taxidermist. The taxidermist sends that hide to a tannery to get tanned. Oh, so it's so like they, more brown? Huh? It's like more, becomes more brown or? <clears throat> it keeps it from rotting away, basically. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Turns, turns it into leather. And there's two types of tannery, hair on, hair off. Hair off is what they make belt buckles and seats and stuff out of hair on is for taxidermists or make a bear wall, you know, bear rug or whatever. And that's what we did up there was, uh, hair on tanning for taxidermists. And in fact, you had to be a taxidermist for us to take a hide from you. And then uh, I've got, I was at a battalion training meeting. I said, what's the chance of me going to Guantanamo? Zero. Outstanding. All Who's right. in the training meeting? Huh? Who's in the, in the training meeting? Mansard Major Lincoln. Okay. Uh, Dan Lincoln. I remember yeah. That. And Colonel Oswald. Was still battalion commander at the time. Uh, 
General Ter- uh, Terrell. Yeah. Was a major. He was the S3 at the time. General. Pablo um, Estrada. Estrada, there you go. General Pablo Estrada, he was a major. He was the four at the time. Yeah. So Sam Dalman was still the one, or the OIC. So anyway... I go to work the next morning. I tell my boss up at the tannery because I've been keeping him informed. Hey, they're talking about me going to Europe, you know, and some are going down to Guantanamo. I walked in, told him, hey, they told me last night, 100%, I am not going to Guantanamo. Okay. He's probably happy about that. Yeah. Just for planning purposes. Yeah. And... About 10 o'clock, the phone rang. He says, hey, Butch, get the phone. It's for you. Yeah. Butch, this is Dan Lincoln. Hey, you're going to Guantanamo. (laughs) Because Brian Bennett was the first sergeant for Charlie Battery. And he had a grand mal seizure. And they would not medically clear him to go. And it looked like the European uh, deployment was falling apart. So they said, all combat arms, the only ones that can go to Guantanamo. So we went to the Caribbean. Guantanamo, the yep. best deployment I ever had. Yeah. It's my only. <laughs> so, anyway, well, I went down there as uh, first sergeant for Charlie Battery. While I was there, I got promoted to command sergeant major for the 210th MP Battalion. So, when we came back from Guantanamo, I Turned in all my stuff for the 119th. And I went down to Taylor to the 210th MP Battalion. And (sighs) Colonel Art Austin was the battalion commander. We had worked together down in Guantanamo. I worked for him. What did you do in Guantanamo? I was... Uh, future plans sorry ops so ops yeah Yeah, future so basically what I did down there is kept track of every unit coming in every unit leaving housing vehicles the whole nine yards so I assigned housing to everybody vehicles stuff like that so I walked into 210th MP Battalion, and all I heard right from the get-go from the Brigade Sergeant Major was how screwed up I was because we were so far behind in NCOERs. Yeah, it sounds that, right. <laughs> this is my first day here. How am I screwed up? <laughs> you know... I don't even know where my office is yet. How am yeah. I screwed up? You know, I said, it'll be taken care of. Well, four months later, I was sitting in the house. Well, I had a trailer at the time, uh, a mobile home. Mm-hmm. And the phone rang. I picked up, hello. Hey, Butch. Yeah. Hey, this is Bob. Okay, Bob, do I know you? Yeah. Bob Taylor. Okay, Bob Taylor, do I know you? Yes. General Bob Taylor. (laughs) Yeah. 
I knew exactly who he was, but I mean, we had drank many beers together at Marshall Street Armory. You know, they had a bar downstairs. Yeah. The, at the end of the hall. Yeah. Under the stairwell. And, but I'd never called him Bob and he had never called me Butch. He was always first sergeant and general. Yeah. You know, first sergeant sir, and sir. Yeah. No, sir, what? He said, I know you just got back from a deployment, but I have a unit on the bubble and I need a CSM. You know, I've only been down at Taylor for, yeah, that doesn't matter. Don't even worry about that. So are you still married at this time? I was married to my third one. Okay. Yes. So, uh, I said, okay, I'm your guy. He said, okay. Ended up being uh, 238 Aviation out of Grand Ledge. And they were going to Kosovo. And you had how much active duty time at, at this point in your career? I wasn't sure. I, I didn't keep track of active duty time, you know. I had 15 active to start with, you know. That's yeah. all I ever. I never really even thought about the uh, ADSW and all that stuff building yeah. up. And all those I just are points. Never thought of it. Yeah. And so took the aviation task force Talon over to. Well, we went down to Fort Hood, Texas, and did a train up down there. What year is this? 90, no, it'd be 2005. Yeah, 2005. We got back in five. We got back in in November of 04. Yeah. Because I had to fight with them at Dick's to let us come home so we could vote. Yep. I remember that. Yeah, I remember that. We got home. Then I went down. I was down there like four months and then went out to the aviation. Was out there like two, three months. And then we went to uh, Fort Hood, Texas for our train up. And then they sent us to Kosovo. So, actually they sent us to Germany. To Hohenfels, Germany for our MRE validation and then what's MRE stand for mobilization readiness evaluation okay so in the army's infinite wisdom they sent us to Fort Dix New Jersey where it was freezing cold in December to send us to the Caribbean or when I landed down there it was 98 degrees and yep. 98% humidity. And it was 17 degrees when we left Fort Dix. Yep. And there was, I remember snow on the ground sitting out. <laughs> we did that training for NEC, <coughs> and I remember was, we were all standing in the snow in formation. Yep. By like foot high <laughs> almost. So we're going to Kosovo, so they sent us to Fort Hood, Texas, where it was 100 degrees. To go to Kosovo, when we got over there, the snow was like five and a half feet deep. And it was yep. freezing. <laughs> so, anyway, we Infinite did that. Wisdom. <laughs> you know, we went over there, did that. While we were there, uh, saw in first class Sheila Ramsey at the time. Yep, I remember her. She's G1 for a little bit. She was, she was a Sergeant First Class at the time, and she was my S1 NCIC. And she came in my office and said, Sergeant Major, you just hit Sanctuary if you want it. <laughs> it's a good said, well, What do you mean, Sanctuary? What? I said, you just went over 18 years active duty. No way. Yeah. 
So, so if you want it, well, yeah, I want to stay active. Yeah. You know? So, because at one time, sanctuary, it was mandated. If you hit 18 years, it was mandated. You had to stay active duty. Then, there were so many guys hitting uh, sanctuary, but owned businesses and stuff. You know, they were in the guards or reserves or whatever, you know, and they did not want to stay active duty because they had a business and everything that they were running. And so then it became an option if you want it or not. Well, yeah, I want it. Yeah, no kidding. So, uh, so you're at 18 years of active duty. You hit sanctuary. Yeah. You get told that, hey, you just hit sanctuary and you can stay on orders yeah. until you retire. So, so that's what I did. I've already graduated the academy, uh, Sergeant Major's Academy. When we came back from um, Guantanamo, they offered everybody a school of their choice. And I took command sergeant major course at Fort Leavenworth. So they sent me out there. And so now coming back from Kosovo and I was supposed to take a field artillery battalion in Fort Campbell, Kentucky, which is like the dream job for me. You know, I'm going back light Going back to the 101st, what a perfect way to end a career. But they backfilled it with somebody else. Said, no, you're not going down there. You're going to 10th Mountain and taking an artillery battalion up there at Fort Drum, New York. Okay, they're still light, meaning they're towed howitzers. Mm-hmm. Great. I get up there and they said, no, you are not taking a field artillery battalion. You're going to be fire support element for the division. No, I'm, I'm getting a battalion. I'm a band sergeant major. I'm getting a battalion. No, you're not, not here. So I called the department of army. Talked to the guy up there, sanctuary department. Yeah. And I said, hey, you told me I was getting this battalion. That's two battalions I was supposed to get, and now I'm not getting either one. Well, you got to be a graduate of the academy. Yeah. 32103. What's that? That's my student number. <laughs> I already graduated. Oh, well, you got to be a command sergeant major course graduate. Yeah, did that in February 07. Fort Leonard, Fort Leonard Wood, or Fort Leavenworth, yeah. Kansas. Oh, well, you got to have a battalion in a combat zone. <laughs> He's making stuff up at this point. Yeah. yeah. Was it okay? I had. I had a unit down at Guantanamo. Granted, it's not combat, but it still had International Aviation Task Force in Kosovo. You know, had an MP battalion. I didn't tell them how long, but nonetheless, I'm yeah. building my resume, you know. He said, okay, I'll call you back tomorrow. All right. So he called me back. Yeah. Uh, I was at Fort Drum, just sitting around. He says, okay, I got good news, bad news. What do you want first? I don't care. You going to tell them to me both? I don't care. He said, got your battalion. Okay, that's good news. What's bad news? Bad news is, it's in Germany. I love Germany. I've been there twice. I love Germany. What's nothing bad there. So he's just like shocked, you know? Okay. And so, you're still married and you're, is I your was, wife with you? I was, 
married a third time, and we had just started building this house. And we decided she would stay here till the house was built and everything. We had horses at the time. But I would bring her frequently to Germany, you know, to visit. Then when I got over there, I found out they were on the bubble to go to Iraq. You know, I brought her over and she was there for my change of responsibility taking over the battalion. But, you know, I got telling her, hey, I'm getting ready to go to Iraq in a few months. You're going to be here by yourself or you stay home in a new house. Yep, I'm not coming over here by myself. So, yeah, good thing was I had a battalion. The thing that was different about it was it was a Ford support battalion. It was the 47th Ford support battalion. So, Ford support means? I had transportation company. I had a maintenance company. I had a logistics and I had a medical company. So for the brigade, all the doctors in the brigade, they belong to me. All the truck drivers belong to me. Uh, third shop maintenance belong to me. Logistics, when you order pancake batter, that went through my people. When you ordered a bolt for your track, it went through my people. So, it was something I was not familiar with at yeah. all. <laughs> I was going to say, going from combat arms to that. Yeah. It's definitely a change of pace. And when I got there, they wanted to fire me before I ever got there. Because I was a National Guard Sergeant Major. Well, my commander, who was Lieutenant Colonel Michael Russell, who just retired Major General Michael Russell from Fort Knox, um, Second Sustainment Theater Commander. So he said, nope, that's who DA says I'm getting. That's who I'm going to take. If there's a problem with him, We'll just fire from there. And he was just a fantastic commander. He come to find out he had been enlisted before and he was the 13 Bravo. Perfect. <laughs> per match <laughs> <Yeah>. made in heaven. <laughs> and so, you know, he did his time, got out as an E4, went to college, went to OCS or ROTC, ROTC, got commissioned, and came back. So, we had a great, great relationship. We really did. Um, we did not always agree, but if we disagreed, it was behind closed doors in his office. And when that door opened up, it was whatever it United was. United front. Sometimes yeah. I won the argument. Sometimes I did not. But it was never, well, because of the sergeant major. And it was never, well, the colonel said it was, this is what we're doing. And that was both of us, you know. And so... We had each other's back. He supported me 100%. And did great things. Went to Iraq. Uh, got blown up two times in three days. And Do you take any shrapnel or anything? 
No. Just your no. unit? Just uh, because of the AMRAP vehicle, the way it's designed, two IEDs, you know, just that bolt hull that they have on it to flex the blast outward. That's the only reason I'm alive. I firmly believe that. It's a great design. Um, vehicles are pretty heavy, but and also paid off dividends with the blast. Yeah. You know? Saving people is the most important part. Right. So, um, went over there, came back to Germany. Uh, let's see. We got back in June. And Colonel Russell left in July. And I was supposed to PCS, let me think, like in November of nine, 2009. Yeah, because it was a 17 and a half month deployment. From Germany. It's a really long deployment. Yep. And that was in 2008 to 9. 7 to 9. 7 to 9. So you're at your your last year. March. Yeah. But I I had no desire to retire. I really did not. And they weren't going to force you at at the 20 year mark? No, because... That was another thing. In order for me to take a battalion, I had to re-enlist active army. <laughs> I don't care. Yeah. You know? And so when I was a Fort Drum, I re-enlisted active army. So, um, when I was in Iraq, Sergeant Majors, one year out, have got to call DA Sergeant Major Brain and say, "Hey, you know, I'm one year out," and then they start looking for you in an assignment. And this Master Sergeant up there, she says, "Well, you're going to Fort Bliss, Texas. That's where the First Armored Division is moving. You're going to Fort Bliss, Texas, and you're going right back to the box." No, I'm not. I have some issues here. My shoulders were tore up bad, really bad. I said, I just need time to get some things taken care of, and I'm back in. I'm I'm all in. It just, I'm not going to be the guy that sits behind the desk saying, oh, you can't do push-ups? You got to go home. I can't do them. But I'm a sergeant major. It doesn't yeah. count. Lead by example. So I had leaders like that growing up, and I despised them. And I was not going to be that guy. A lot of my soldiers may have despised me, but it wasn't for that. Yeah. <laughs> you know? But I said, I won't do that. I'll draw up my retirement paperwork. And she said, no, you won't. I said, Master Sergeant, you don't know me. <laughs> so that ended the conversation. I went and drew up retirement paperwork. So I think I was supposed to retire like in November of 09. But since we got back to Germany, uh, I had to change of responsibility. My replacement came in and did a, about a month overlap two weeks before he took over. And, and I just kind of hung around a little bit. Um, now I went to launch stool. They operated on my right shoulder and I said, man, Sergeant Major, we can't operate on both shoulders before you retire. No, you have to, sir. Yeah, in order for me to get out, right? No, 
because uh, if you don't, I'm going to be fighting with the VA for three years before they'll take care of it. Oh, yeah, didn't think about it. Okay, so we're going to do the microsurgery, you know. So they did that, and like five weeks later, they did my left arm, my left shoulder, and I flew home on the 12th of January, 2010, and I was on terminal leave until the 1st of June. I had like five and a half months of leave built up. Yeah. So, and how that goes. They wanted me to cash out and I wouldn't do that because if you cash out, all you get is base pay. And then they take taxes away from that. So by not cashing out, I got my housing allowance, food allowance, full, you know, da 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 I would have missed out on so much money. Yeah. No, I know what so, you mean. I think I had like four, four and a half when I retired. You're, you're absolutely right. So, yeah, I, I came home on, got home on the 12th of January. And my retirement date was 1st of June, 2010. So total service, 14 September, 76 to 1 June, 10. That's a long time. (laughs) It's the longest person that I've ever spoken to. (laughs) Like you've had the most time in service. Yeah, it's, it's a long time. And, you know, I hit all the branches of the army as far as reserve, active duty, IRR, and national guard, then back to active duty. So, yeah. Very interesting (laughs) sequence of events for your military career. So if there's anyone listening to this recording, what would you want them to take away from from it biggest thing is the change it you know in in the military well there's a couple things but i want to make this point when i was in basic training in ait at fort dix new jersey in 77 we got a pass and me and three buddies of mine we went to asbury park new jersey They have a boardwalk there. Mm -hmm. It was September. It was nasty. Nobody was on the beach or nothing. You know, the boardwalk was shut down. But to just go to Asbury Park. And we were walking down Asbury Park in our khakis. That's the tan uniform, short sleeves. And a bunch of, I say a bunch, maybe. Five or six. Guys came out, you baby killers, you baby killers, and threw bags at us, paper bags. Now, they were wet, but they threw them and went, they splattered on us and everything, and it was shit in the bags. Literal shit. Whether it's human or dog, I don't know. Never sent for DNA or nothing like that. But it was shit. It was feces. Yeah, I'm sorry you went through that. And, you know, calling us baby killers and everything. And it's like, yeah, we just joined on. We ain't killed nobody, you know. Yeah. But that was the mentality of some of our nation at that time. You fast forward to 2010, I retired, and everybody wants to call me a hero. I'm not a hero. I'd never been a hero. I have worked with some heroes. I've been friends with some heroes. I've never, I was just a guy trying to do my job, 
and do the best I could. And as I progressed in rank, my responsibilities changed. And it changed from calling fire on a target, whether it was mortars, artillery, naval gunfire, close air support, tack air. Responsibility changed from that to taking care of soldiers. And everything I've ever done, as far as with soldiers, is to make sure they came home alive. Because that's always been a possibility. Mm -hmm. And that that's always been my number one concern. So, Putting other people before, you know, I've yeah, other done, people's safety. Been to Iraq three times, Afghanistan twice, Central South America. I'm good. Nobody, I have not lost anybody under my watch. And that's awesome that you haven't. I mean, it's a really good thing. That's not saying it all belongs to me. It doesn't. I'm just saying. That was my focus. A lot of people thought I was the biggest ass ever lived. Well, I probably was, but it wasn't just to be an ass. There was a reason. You know, it'd be nice if you could say, hey, do this. Or, Why don't you go do this? Okay. And they'd be off, but... You know as well as I do, that's not the way people are. No. Nope. So they don't always see the the reason behind things. And it's funny because like you you were a specialist for me and then made sergeant while we were in Getmo. I'm sure you didn't understand a lot of things I did. But as you progressed in rank, we're ranked Start first class, right? Yep. So when you became smoke or whatever position you held, I'm sure a lot of things changed in your thinking. You know, I don't know where you went from our time, but if you had soldiers, it had to change because yep. all of a sudden you're not buds anymore. You have to get this mission accomplished. So, yeah, perspectives change as you grow in rank and age. <laughs> <laughs> it does. Yeah. yeah. So, what's some good advice? Um, I really appreciate you taking the time out to speak with me today about your military experience. Um, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Thank you, Brian. Thank you for listening to another episode of Veterans Archives, the podcast that brings you the story of the men and women who have created and lived our military history. If you or someone you know served in the military and would like to share your story with Veterans Archives, please go to www.veteransarchives.org, select the Apply Now button, and fill out our application, and someone will get right back with you. Veterans Archives is a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and we rely on the donations of our listeners. If you are enjoying these stories and you support our efforts, please go to www.veteransarchives.org and select the Donate button. Any donation is certainly appreciated. Look for Veterans Archives on your favorite social media. We are on LinkedIn. Instagram, and Facebook. Just look for Veterans Archives. Like, follow, and share our page. We'd certainly appreciate it. If you or someone you know is a veteran and you are struggling with mental health issues, please dial 988 and select option one for the Veterans Crisis Hotline. Please be sure to tune in next time for the next episode of Veterans Archives. <laughs>